three, two, one. Hello and welcome for everyone who's in attendance. Uh, this is the campaign finance and reporting training uh, for the November 3rd, 2020 election. We're going to wait a few more minutes to see if more people are making their way in and then we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you again. Um, my name is Johnny Hosey. I'm an engagement and compliance officer here at the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with me from being um, professional treasurers or having run for office previously. So I'll do my best to keep uh, the beginning part of this training as concise as possible. Um, in addition, uh, please, please make sure that uh, at the end of the first part of the training that you file your form 107, if you are not going to be uh, attending the second half, which is for public financing uh, for the November election. Um, at this time, I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the San Francisco Ethics Commission's mandatory training for candidates running for city elective offices on November 3rd, 2020. This training discusses campaign finance rules and regulations that apply to local candidates and their treasurers. In addition to this training, it is recommended that candidates and treasurers watch the local candidates, treasurers, and committee basics training video offered by the Fair Political Practices Commission. San Francisco voters established the Ethics Commission in 1993 to ensure that local ethics laws, campaign finance, and lobbying laws are strong and effective. The city's campaign finance laws are built on state laws, and over the time, over that time, the city has added significant provisions to, to the laws including a limited public financing program for campaigns for the offices of mayor and board of, Supervi board of supervisors. The discussion of campaign finance rules in this training are necessarily general and they are not comprehensive. There may be aspects of the law that apply to you that are not covered in this training. Please consult the campaign and governmental conduct code, supporting regulations, commission opinions and advice, and other guidance documents made available by the commission. If you have specific questions regarding the rules or their application, please contact the Ethics Commission staff or read the laws that may be cited. If there is a conflict between what is presented in this training and the law, the law governs. All right, so getting started, establishing candidacy. First, a uh, form that is required, uh, well, two forms that are required. One is the declaration of intention to solicit or accept contributions. Uh, that is filed with the Department of Elections that must be filed prior to sol soliciting or accepting contributions. As well, uh, you must file the candidate intention statement with our office. Uh, this is also required to be filed prior to soliciting or accepting contributions, including loans and before making expenditures, including the candidate's personal funds. So you must declare your candidacy using those two, two uh, forms prior to financial activity. Uh, in addition, uh, you should complete the nomination process with the Department of Elections. 
this is due by uh, June 9th, 2020 for Board of Supervisors uh, candidates and on August 7th, 2020 for all other races. You can, depart you can contact the Department of Elections for further information regarding ballot qualification requirements. Uh, in addition, there's a candidate statement form 700, which is required to be filed with the Department of Elections by the applicable deadline for filing nomination papers. Candidates raising or spending $2,000 or more. So establishing a campaign contribution trust bank account at a bank located in the city of San Francisco. All contributions must be deposited in and expenditures must be made from this bank account, including loans. Candidates may use their personal funds to pay filing fees without first depositing the funds into the campaign bank account. Personal funds used to pay filing or statement fees do not count towards the $2,000 threshold. Um, the including loans part is important to, to note. A lot of candidates will get started, want to um, create their website prior to uh, creating a campaign bank account and then potentially want to have that, that money looked at as a loan and, and once they receive contributions, get paid back those funds. If you don't establish a campaign bank account and first deposit those funds into your campaign bank account and, and thusly spend them from that campaign bank account, uh, those funds are not eligible to be paid back to you in the form of a, a, a loan to your, to your own committee. So keep that in mind as a, a common thing that comes up. Um, additionally, there's a statement of organization. That's the form 410. You file the original with the Secretary of State and one copy with uh, the Ethics Commission. Uh, this is due within 10 days of raising or spending $2,000 or more or any time prior to reaching that threshold. Optionally, the Form 410 can be filed electronically through our website using that file, um, but a printed copy still with wet signature still needs to be sent to the Secretary of State with the $50 annual filing fee. Candidates raising or spending less than $2,000. They also need to establish a bank account. Um, raising or spending any funds, including loans other than the candidate's own personal funds. Um, personal funds used to pay filing or statement fees are excluded from bank account requirements and do not count towards the $2,000 threshold. Office holder and candidate statement, FBC Form 470. Um, this, is, this is in lieu of the Form 460 that uh, candidates who establish a form, uh, establish a committee will file. So you will file, if you stay under the $2,000 threshold, you will file one uh, campaign statement which covers the entirety of the year. Uh, you file this with uh, our office um, on or before the first pre-election deadline. Personal funds used to pay for filing fees or statement fees are not counted towards the $2,000 committee threshold. If the 470 is filed and the candidate then raises $2,000 or more in that calendar year, the candidate must file a Form 470 supplement and notify each candidate seeking the same office within 48 hours and file a Form 410 within 10 days of reaching the qualification threshold. The Form 470 may be filed electronically also in that file. Mandatory training. So as you know from the notice, uh, this, this training is mandatory. Uh, this training, attending this training and, and, and viewing it will satisfy your training requirement. So at the end of the training, just make sure to file your Form 107 uh, to receive credit for the training. So every candidate and his or her treasurer must complete a training administered by the San Francisco Ethics Commission. We do appreciate you guys, uh, everyone's understanding of the circumstances and allowing for us to use the tools necessary to get you the information. So as always, we're always here and, uh, and available uh, electronically or um, uh, to, to get the information uh, to you. So. If, if there's any questions, do let us know. And, and then also just remember to file your 107. So establishing a net file account, um, you must complete a signature verification card. So you file that with us by mail or in person. So essentially we had to revise the requirements on this due to the COVID-19 shelter in place order here in San Francisco. So previously we could basically take the notarized uh, form uh, and and through the mail, uh, but at this time we do have limited access to our office and to mail. Uh, so we are asking that if you if you have sent your si signature verification card um, in the mail, that you go ahead and, and submit an electronic copy of that using our electronic portal um, that we're using to take paper forms uh, during this time. So the uh, link is there, and then you know reach out to us uh, if you have any questions. 
And then secondly, previously, you would you were able to come into our office and present your ID and sign in our pre presence without having the form notarized. But due to our office being closed, uh, that's not an option. So if you are in the in the circumstances of not being able to have your signature card not notarized, then uh, you may sign it in lieu of uh, the notary and also submit it in the electronic portal. Uh, this potentially could change in the future, but we'll notify you if that does change. And then you also have to set up an FL user account. So the form 112B is what you use to set up an FL user account. It notifies us here that you, you are requesting information to then link to your FL user account. So the form 112B must be requested, um, sent to us so that we can get you that information to allow for you to file. Uh, also, uh, please note that there are uh, other vendors that you can choose to use. We do have a free net file system. Uh, there's also a paid net file system, uh, but you can also use a third party vendor that's approved and uh, the documents must be in a PAL format uh, for for the, the statements uh, to work. So please keep that in mind. And then we do have a, a video here link that you can refer to as necessary. So running for office, general reminders. Candidates raising or spending $2,000 or more must form a committee. Every candidate who forms a committee must designate a treasurer. A candidate may serve as his or her own treasurer. A committee cannot accept contributions or make expenditures until it has a treasurer. And candidates and treasurers may be held personally liable for campaign finance violations. Contribution limits. All contributions are limited to $500 per, per source per election cycle. So all cumulative contributions from persons affiliates must be aggregated to determine whether they are within the $500 contribution limit. A candidate may contribute or loan more than $500 to his or her own campaign. Cash contributions must be $99 or less, and you may not accept a $100 bill and give change back. Contributions in excess of these limits will be deemed illegal contributions and must be forfeited promptly to the Ethics Commission for deposit into the city's general fund. Um, if you if you are in the position where where you are aware that a contribution needs to be forfeited, uh, go ahead and, and contact our office and we will give you instructions as to how to um, forfeit that um, to our office because even though it goes to the city's general fund, it, it has to come through our office and, and then to the to the city um, that way. So uh, reach out and uh, let us know if you have any questions about forfeiture. Contributor information requirements. A committee may not deposit a contribution of $100 or more unless it has the contributor's full name, street address, occupation, and employer information, or the name of the business for self-employed individuals. Uh, FPPC Manual 2 has examples of acceptable ways to report uh, student and retired donor information. Uh, in, in addition, we have a sample contributor card that's on our website that may be useful to you. And then for contributions over $25, you'll need the following information. The contributor name, the amount of the contribution, the date the contribution was made, and the contributor street address. And, it's, and you should, uh, it should be noted that candidates participating in the public financing program must provide additional documentation uh, we do have a supplemental guide, but those of you who are staying for the second part of the training, um, Robert Hodge will go into more detail on the, on the public financing pieces. And then contributions for which the candidate or committee does not have the required information must be returned within 60 days of receipt or forfeited to the Ethics Commission for deposit in the city's general fund. Federal contributions, uh, this is a newer uh, law. Um, became active uh, this year. So a contribution that is bundled with someone other than the contributors, other than the contributor delivers or transmits a contribution to a candidate. So if the candidate receives $5,000 or more in contributions that were bundled by a single individual, the candidate must file a bundled contributions disclosure report. Um, that is the SFEC 125, and that must be filed uh, at the same time that uh, the campaign finance statement form 460 would be due for the committee um, and is due on on or before the deadline. So uh, that will be also required. Uh, this is a new rule. So if you have any questions um, about it, do reach out. People have already uh, done so and we'll be happy to 
um, that that uh, the proper way to file. And then receipt of contributions. A contribution will not be considered received if it is not cash, negotiated, or deposited, and it is returned to the donor by the closing date of the campaign statement on which the contribution would otherwise be reported. Contributions received during the 90 days prior to an election must be returned within 24 hours of receipt. Cash contributions must be refunded within 72 hours of receipt. Campaign contribution prohibitions. So cash contributions over $100 or more are prohibited. Contributions over $25 without the required supporting document documentation are, are prohibited. Contributions from corporations and now um, with the ACAO um, accountability ordin ordinance, the uh, newer law, uh, it, expand, it expands to include limited liability companies or limited liability partnerships. Previously, it was just corporations, so be aware of that. Um, in addition, contributions from lobbyists, if registered to lobby, the office, office of the candidate uh, of the candidate is seeking uh, election to. Contributions from foreign nationals without lawful permanent residence, contributions in exchange for official action, earmarked contributions, and contributions from appointed members of boards and commissions, they may not solicit contributions from, from over $250 from persons who are parties to or participants in proceedings uh, pending before them. So in short, if, if you are on a, a member, if you are a member of a board of commission, uh, you cannot solicit contributions over $250, $250 if, um, if those persons are parties to or participants in proceedings before, before yourself. And continuing, accepting or soliciting contributions from contractors or their affiliates who are seeking, negotiate, negotiating, or recently entered into a city contract. So the prohibition applies when the contract or series of contracts in the same fiscal year has an anticipated or actual total of $100,000 or more and the city elective officer, a board on which that officer serves or the board of the state agency on which the officer's appointee serves must approve the contract or series of contracts. This applies from the time that a contract contractor submits a proposal until either termination of the negotiations or 12 months from the date the contract was approved. It also applies to city elective officers, candidates for the office held by such individuals and committees controlled by such individuals are candidates. Again, if there's any question of if, if a contribution is acceptable, I would recommend not depositing it and um, contacting us and many times before uh, people do that and we can work you through, walk you through the necessary uh, vetting process to ensure that you're not uh, depositing a contribution that is in violation of any of these rules. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, this one is, this is also new. Um, it's, it pertains to land use matters. So officers and candidates for mayor, board of supervisors or city attorney uh, so this is applicable to those those three offices uh, and committees controlled by such officers are prohibited from accepting or soliciting contributions from any person or the person's affiliated entities with the financial interest in a land use matter pending before certain boards and commissions, excluding primary residents uh, land use matter related um, uh, pending matters. So a person or affiliated entity has a financial interest if they meet one of the following criteria. They have an ownership interest of $5 million or more in a property or, pro or project. They hold a position of director or principal officer, or they are a member of the board of directors for an entity that has an ownership interest of $5 million or more in a property or project. Uh, if they are, if, if uh, and they are a developer with an estimated construction cost of at least $5 million in a property or project. So this prohibition applies from the date of the commencement of the land use matter until 12 months following the date of final decision, the final decision or, or ruling. Uh, so we do have a candidate's guide for city elective office that we have updated um, information regarding this. Uh, we have references to various city departments uh, for which you can uh, search for uh, land use matters. Um, but same thing on this one. If if you have questions or need any assistance, uh, refer to the guide. And then, uh, if you need further assistance, certainly uh, reach out to us. We'll be happy to help. So loan limits. There are limits on loans loans from a candidate's personal funds. So 
Candidates for mayor not receiving public funds. The loan limit is $120,000. Candidates for assessor, public defender, city attorney, treasurer, district attorney, or sheriff. Loan limit is $3,500, $35,000, excuse me. Candidates for board of education, community college, district, or board of supervisors not receiving public financing, $15,000 is the loan limit. And then candidates for mayor and board of supervisors who are receiving public funds are limited to $5,000 in uh, loans. And loans from anyone other than the candidate are considered contributions and they may not exceed $500. Payment of accrued expenses, accrued expenses. Candidates who accept goods or services on credit must pay within 180 days of receipt of a bill or invoice and in no even and in no even later than it can't be later than 180 days after the last calendar date of the month in which the goods or services were delivered or rendered. So if it's not paid within 180 days, accrued expenses become contributions and they're subject to the $500 contribution limit. A good faith dis dispute um, is not included, uh, as well as debt owned to a financial institution uh, for an outstanding credit card balance uh, does not apply. So there are some times that there are good faith disputes between uh, a committee and maybe services rendered and so forth. Uh, if you are in that situation, do contact our office. Uh, if you attempt to, to terminate your committee uh, showing debt, we essentially will contact you and look into it anyway. So make sure that you let us know if, if that is the case and um, we can document it accordingly and assist you with filing properly. Uh, so you, you report accrued expenses on Schedule F of the Form 460. Use of campaign funds. Candidates may use funds in his or her account for two purposes. Running for the city elective office specified on the candidate's declaration of intent and if elected, paying for expenses associated with holding that office. Funds must first be deposited into the campaign trust account or the committee bank account before funds are expended, except for personal funds used to pay filing fees as mentioned before. Campaign funds, other than public funds, may be used to pay for costs related to administrative, civil, or criminal lit litigation, only if di directly related to activities of the committee that are consistent with its primary objective. But any amount, but any amount may not be used to pay a fine, penalty, judgment, or settlement relating to an improper use of campaign funds or bribery. Public funds may not be used to pay for expenses incurred in connection with an administrative or judicial proceeding, civil or criminal fee fines, or late filing fees. Again, the second part of our training will go into more detail regarding restrictions uh, for public financing. And coordination of expenditures. So, for an expenditure to be independent, it may not be made at the behest of the candidate, and the candidate may not coordinate, cooperate, consult, act in concert, or otherwise control the expenditure. Should any of these occur, the expenditure shall be treated as a contribution to the candidate and is subject to the $500 contribution limit. Disclaimers. Disclaimers and reporting requirements for campaign communications. State and local law impose disclaimer requirements. I think a lot of folks who are um, our treasurers who have uh, done this before, you're aware of uh, our local requirements. Um, the state has uh, added some, some requirements uh, recently as well. So we do have disclaimer charts, uh, which have been updated online. So please reference those updated charts. Um, we did link it here, but in short, advertisements, advertisements including mailers, radio, television, and newspaper paper ads, telephone calls, text messages now, that's, that's new and electronic media ads do require disclaimers, so refer to our charts for information regarding that. And guidelines pertaining to political advertising disclaimers by city candidate committees are, are available on our website. Um, and mass mailing, uh, mass mailing is 200 or more substantially similar pieces of mail. You file a mass mailing disclosure statement when that occurs as a candidate. Uh, you will file that with us along with a copy of the original piece of the mailing. It will be due within five working days after the date of the mailing or within 48 hours if the date of the mailing occurs during the 16 days immediately preceding the election. And you can see um, the specifications that we have here. It's a new system. It's all electronic. Uh, previously, uh, we were accepting those through the um, email and, uh, and uh, face to face or at the office as well. 
uh, even though that was a little less common, but it's all electronic now. Um, and uh, we do have specifications here uh, linked and then also on our website uh, to assist you if you're having issues with uh, getting everything set up to be submitted electronically uh, for those ads. Prohibited activities, political activity restrictions. There is no use of public resources or city and county of San Francisco staff time for campaigning. There is no solicitation of city and county officials or employees um, uh, unless it's in the normal course of campaigning. If you have any questions, you can let us know. Also, you may not use campaign funds for non-campaigning purposes. Um, be aware of, of, of these rules and make sure that folks who are um, working uh, with you uh, are aware of these types of prohibitions. So the campaign statement form 460, after a committee is formed, committees must file semi-annual campaign statements as well as three pre-election statements in the months before the election. The third pre-election statement is filed for the period ending six days before the election. We have filing schedules which outline a lot of these rules as well as the deadlines, so um, please be aware of those. Uh, in addition, uh, this must be filed electronically with their office. Uh, this particular form discloses re receipts, expenditures, and other reportable activity for the period covered, and com committees must continue to e-file semi-annual campaign statements with us, irrespective of the level of financial activity until the committee properly files the required termination statements. So um, it can be fairly common that people run for office, um, um, maybe don't win election, and then kind of you know, drop off uh, from filing uh, and don't properly terminate their committee. Um, that is uh, not something that is uh, acceptable. So uh, make your candidates aware, or if you're a candidate who's doing this on your own, please be aware that uh, you do have to properly terminate your committee. Uh, it will remain active in our system uh, if, if not, uh, and you could be subject to fees and fines. Uh, in addition, there is an officeholder and, and candidate campaign statement short form. So this is the form 470 that we went over uh, briefly earlier. So candidates who do not, who do not have an open committee and who, who are not, who will not raise or spend $2,000 or more in, in this calendar year, they'll file a form 470 on or before the first pre-election deadline. Uh, once that's done, there are no additional statements uh, that are needed to be filed during the calendar year if campaign activity remains under $2,000. You will file the supplement accordingly if you do uh, go over that threshold and uh, you will file um, with us uh, using our paper portal or electronic paper portal for now uh, and it can also be filed electronically. Uh, in addition, there are cross filing rules. So this is a state rule. So in short, when a candidate or office holder controls more than one committee for the purpose of election to office, they have to file all the committee statements at the same time um, that the uh, the local committee is required to file. So uh, for semi annual pre-election statements, for instance, if someone has run for state senate or any other any other position, local position as well, um, and they haven't, that committee is still currently active, uh, that active committee must disclose at the same time uh, that they otherwise will need to disclose for the other committee. So if you have any questions on that, let us know. We do check these things. So we will let you know if, if you owe us a statement from another committee. Uh, and if it's filed late, uh, we, we will potentially uh, charge late fees on that. OK, late contribution report. So a candidate committee must file a late contribution report form 497 electronically with the Ethics Commission. So this form is due within 24 hours of making or receiving contributions, including loans and in-kind contributions of $1,000 or more during the 90 days prior to the election. This applies to contributions or loans made by a candidate to his or her, her own campaign committee. Voluntary expenditure ceiling. The voluntary expenditure ceiling or the VEC, um, you will file the SFEC form 128. This is applicable to candidates for city attorney, treasurer, district attorney, sheriff, assessor, public defender, board of education, and community college district. Um, and you can essentially accept the volunt voluntary um, expenditure ceiling. It is not a requirement. Um, it, is, it is due by the deadline for filing nomination papers with the uh, Department of Elections, and it may not be withdrawn once it is filed. Candidates who have accepted the VEC will be posted on the Commission's website. 
So the ceiling um, or the limit is $243,000 in expenditures for city attorney, treasurer, district attorney, sheriff, assessor, and public defender, and $104,000 for Board of Education and Community College District. And if by chance um, a candidate thereafter exceeds that threshold, they do have to file the SFEC 134B and uh, you can refer to the form or the candidate's guide for city elective office for more information regarding that. Record keeping. So it's vital that all candidates implement a good system of record keeping for all contributions, expenditures, and other financial activity uh, for your campaign. Such records are necessary for the preparation of accurate and complete campaign statements. It uh, should be noted that all publicly financed candidates are subject to mandatory audits and candidates who do not participate in the program may also be selected for audit. Records must be retained for four years from the date of the filing and you can see our audits page for more information regarding the guidelines for organizing records. Reporting and record keeping. These are general reminders. It's your duty to amend and supplement. Um, information is necessary. Uh, candidates have a duty to timely amend or supplement any, any incorrect or changed information. So the standard is once you know something is incorrect, uh, you're required to amend it. Um, Committee changes, uh, any changes to your committee are required to be updated on the form 410. So uh, you can't, you know, just send us an email and say, you know, this is this is changed so forth, uh, as many of you are aware. Um, but please make sure that any changes to contact information, purpose of the committee, treasurer, so forth. In this case, you're all candidates, so the purpose will be the same. But any changes, make sure to uh, to get that updated. Uh, and it's required within 10 days of any change uh, from the form 410 and uh, within 24 hours during the last 16 days before the election. Committees must continue to e-file semi-annual campaign statements with the Ethics Commission irrespective of the level of financial activity until the committee files a, term, a statement of termination. Uh, you must also file accurate and timely reports to avoid late fees and penalties and then make sure to keep complete and organized records. Uh, city candidates are required to maintain records for four years to substantiate their campaign reporting. Surplus funds. So after the election, campaign funds become surplus and may be only used for the following purpose. They may be returned to contributors on a last in, first out basis. They may be donated to a charitable organization or to the city. Uh, they may be used to pay unpaid bills associated with the campaign including terminating the committee, bookkeeping fees, legal fees, preparation of campaign statements and audits. Also, uh, campaign manual two, you can refer to that for information pertaining to redesignating and transferring funds before the funds become surplus for a future election. You can also reach out to us as um, a lot of folks do and we'll go over uh, what happens in that process. And then when do funds become surplus? Successful candidates is when the candidate leaves office unsuccessful candidates on the closing date of the post-election reporting period uh, that it usually ends up being the last day of the year. Um, so 30 days after that, January 30th is how that usually works out um, for the November election. So candidates who receive public funds uh, must return all unexpended public funds to the city for deposit into the election campaign uh, fund. So different rules for public financing candidates, uh, candidates who receive public financing. So Again, um, Rob will be going over that uh, shortly. And then termination. So candidates may terminate the committees after they have ceased receiving contributions and making expenditures, eliminated or have declared that it has no intention or ability to discharge all of its debts or accrued expenses, loans received and other obligations. There are no surplus funds and they have filed all required campaign statements disclosing all reportable transaction. Uh, we recommend that you close the bank account. It's technically not a requirement, but we highly recommend that you do. Uh, in addition, you can refer to slide 20 for more information pertaining to accrued expenses. And then to terminate, you must do the following. So there's two requirements to properly terminate. The first of which is to file the form 410 termination statement. So it's essentially the, the cover page. It can just be the cover page of the form 410 and it's marked off termination. Um, you file that again, both with us, the original goes to Secretary of State. We get 
um, the copy uh, and you have to indicate when the committee, uh, the date of termination, uh, which is generally the date the bank account was closed or the committee ceased financial activity in that regard. Uh, and then you also need to electronically file the form 460 termination statement. So when you do that, um, you should be demonstrating a zero ending cash balance, uh, uh, which, which should match your committee bank account at the time of closure. Over here, we'll go over accountability and responsibility. Um, public disclosure. So required disclosure of campaign statements will help inform the public about a committee's campaign activity. There potentially can be late filing fees. So we do charge $10 per day for paper filings, which are late, and $25 per day for electronic filings, which are late. Audits. All committees are subject to audit. Again, publicly financed committees are mandatorily audited. So. Again, we'll go over that later and then enforcement. So failure to file campaign statements may, may make you subject to civil, criminal and administrative penalties. So just be aware of these rules uh, to avoid potentially violating the law. OK, so that pretty much covers the initial part of the training. We do have support, uh, uh, support and resources listed here as well as on our website. Um, as always, you can reach out for for anything um, to our team and we'll be happy to guide you in the right um, area, but essentially this is just a list of uh, support and resources and um, our contact information here. And then uh, lastly, please make sure to file your 107. The second part of this training is, is pertinent to uh, candidates in November, Board of Supervisors candidates who are seeking public financing. Uh, this, this will be uh, run by our principal uh, campaign finance auditor, uh, Robert Hodge. So we'll get started on that shortly. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Johnny said, my name is Rob Hodge. I am the lead campaign finance auditor at the Ethics Commission. Uh, we'll now begin our presentation, um, which is an introduction to the San Francisco uh, Public Financing Program. This is directed towards candidates for the Board of Supervisor and for the Office of Mayor, uh, specifically candidates seeking election to the Board of Supervisors in the November 3rd, 2020 election. Um, so as stated, uh, this is just an introduction or overview to the public financing program. This presentation is intended for informative purposes only. This is not a prerequisite or a requirement for the program. In other words, participating in this presentation, uh, it's not required in order for you to be considered eligible to receive public funds. The public financing program was adopted under Prop O in the November 2000 ballot, and it was initially created as a voluntary system of limited public financing for candidates for the Board of Supervisors. This program was extended in 2006 to include mayoral candidates. This program is designed to strengthen the accountability of city candidates to the voters who elect them. Candidates who meet established criteria can qualify to receive limited amounts of public funds for their campaigns and can spend less time fundraising and more time discussing issues important to their constituents. The goal was to increase the importance of relatively small individual contributions so that public financing system can help encourage new diverse voices among candidates as well as those whom they are elected to represent. This presentation only contains general information about the program. For specific requirements and guidelines, as well as information regarding how to file specific forms and statements, candidates should consult any one of the following. On the Ethics Commission website, we do have our supplemental guides for public financing. There is also the Ethics Commission guide for uh, candidates guide for city elective office. And the Fair Political Practice Commission has their filing manuals 
and manual two is specifically designated for local candidates. Again, these guides are available online. As our office is closed, you will not be able to attain them on site. You can also direct any specific questions to the Ethics Commission phone or email address listed here. Uh, we, even though our office is closed, we are responsive to all inquiries that we receive. Please be aware that in the event of any conflict or inconsistency between this presentation and the supplemental guides or the city campaign finance reform ordinance and supporting regulations, the supporting guide, the ordinance and the regulations shall control. In other words, please re rely upon the letter of the law as that is the ultimate uh, regulation or rules that we will be following. Any inconsistencies that may appear here, those are uh, just in error. So again, please review the letter of the law to make sure that you fully understand the rules and requirements of this program. Uh, as a general overview, this is how the program um, will work for candidates. Uh, working through the flow chart, starting in the upper left, First thing is all candidates must meet the general eligibility requirements. These will be discussed in more detail later on and again are covered in specific detail in the supplemental guides. You must file a statement of participation. This must be filed electronically. It is available through the Ethics Commission public filers uh, system. All candidates must demonstrate that they have raised the required amount and number of contributions from San Francisco residents. At that point, you would be eligible to submit a qualifying request. Each submission is re must be reviewed by Ethics Commission staff and is approved by the Executive Director. Upon approval, which the, simply states that you are eligible to participate in the public financing program, candidates will receive an initial payment. Upon demonstrating that they have raised an additional number of contributions above those used to qualify, candidates can then submit a matching request to receive additional funds. As these matching contributions are approved, the executive director will authorize additional payments of matching funds, which will be issued to the candidate. This presentation has been broken down into three general uh, portions or parts. We will cover what you need to know before applying, the process for establishing your eligibility, and additional requirements that apply to candidates that are deemed eligible to participate in the program. Part one, before applying. It is important that candidates and their treasurers understand what they are signing up for. You should review all applicable laws and rules for the public financing program and for candidates in general. These will include the supplemental guides for public financing, the laws section of the Commission's website, and additional information can be found on the public financing section of the Commission's website. If you uh, can access this presentation online, all of these pages are linked within the presentation. So once you download that PDF, you will have direct access to these pages as well. Participating in the public financing program does not guarantee matching funds will be issued to the candidate. Again, you must demonstrate that you qualify to receive certain amounts of matching funds. There are restrictions on how public funds can be used. They must be used for specific purposes related to your candidacy and your election to office. And please remember, all candidates who receive public funds are subject to a mandatory audit. Maintaining good records. As Johnny mentioned, good record keeping is, is critical to your successful participation in the program, as well as a good general practice for all candidate committees. It is important to establish a good system early on. Under state and city law, you are required to retain financial records for a minimum of four years, even if you do not participate in the public financing program. Committees are expected to maintain a wide range of supporting documents that can include contribution records, bank statements related to deposits and check registers, 
any copies of advertisements or other communications that are distributed, and records related to any expenditures that are made, such as canceled checks, electronic payment records, or invoices and other receipts. In order to receive public funds, candidates are expected to submit supporting documents maintained for each contribution that they have received and use in their qualifying and matching applications. Important dates for any candidates that are seeking public financing. These dates are specific to the November 3rd, 2020 election. Contributions that you will use to establish your eligibility must be received between May 3rd, 2019 and August 25th, 2020. Please be aware that the deadline to file a statement of participation, which indicates that you intend to participate in the public financing program, must be received no later than Friday, June 12th, 2020. Again, this statement merely indicates your intent to participate. This does not include your contributions or your actual application to be determined as eligible to participate. Monday, June 15th is the first date that our office will disperse any funds authorized under the program. The last date that you can submit a new qualifying request is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. And the last date that a candidate may submit a matching request for additional funds is 5 p.m. on Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. Please be aware there are additional dates and deadlines that do apply to candidates participating in the public financing program. These are covered in more detail in the supplemental guides as well as the law section of our website. General requirements uh, for candidates that are applying for public financing. This is only a limited list. This is not all inclusive of all requirements that a candidate must meet in order to be determined eligible to receive public financing. But in addition to being eligible to run for and hold the office of board of supervisor or mayor, a candidate needs to demonstrate that they have filed all forms and statements required under city and state law. You must agree to campaign spending limits, which are referred to as individual expenditure ceilings. Please be aware these are different than the voluntary expenditure limits that apply to candidates for board of supervisor or other city elected, or excuse me, board of education, uh, school board, other city elective office. For candidates for supervisor and candidates for the office of mayor, they are held to the individual expenditure ceiling. It is a different term, so please be aware of that. Candidates need to demonstrate that they have paid all outstanding fines or penalties that may be owed to the city. You need to have had no prior findings of campaign finance violations within the last five years. And you must agree to only accept loans from yourself and not in excess of $5,000. Please be aware that for uh, potential fines that are owned, owed to the city, for the forms and statements that are required to be filed, and for potential findings, these would apply to your current campaign committee, as well as any other committee that you have either served as an officer, treasurer, or candidate uh, for within the last five years. So if you previously ran for office in a prior election cycle, any fines that are owed, any filings that were not submitted timely, all of that could affect your current qualification for public financing in this election cycle. Establishing eligibility. Once a candidate has met all other requirements of the program, they may apply for public financing by submitting a qualifying request and contribution list. This filing must demonstrate the candidate has raised the required number and amount of qualified contributions. This form and the contribution list can be filed through the city public filer system it can also be filed using NetFile Professional or any other authorized third-party vendor of your choice. What is a qualifying contribution? It's a contribution that is made by an individual who is a San Francisco resident at the time the contribution is made. It is between the amounts of $10 and $100 per contributor, and that is a cumulative amount, which means if a contributor gives $5, you cannot use that individual for your qualifying contribution. 
if they give two contributions of five dollars those two contributions can be aggregated together and would meet that ten dollar minimum threshold and all contributions used in your qualifying request must be received within 18 months prior to the election which is may 3rd 2019 and no later than the 70th day before the election august 25th 2020. please be aware if anyone has contributed more than 100 dollars we will only count the first $100 towards your initial eligibility. However, any remaining balance of contributions they have donated could be eligible for matching, to be used for matching funds in a future submission. Proof of contributions raised must be submitted electronically with the qualifying request and must be accompanied by sufficient supporting documentation. How much do you, candidates need to demonstrate that they have raised as um, for the board of supervisor election in november of this year incumbent candidates need to demonstrate that they have raised fifteen thousand dollars from at least 150 contributors and non-incumbents must demonstrate they have raised ten thousand dollars from at least 100 contributors and again please consult the supplemental guides for public financing on our website for more specific information regarding the content of the qualifying request. Certain types of transactions do not count as qualifying contributions and cannot be used to establish eligibility. These include loans or non-monetary contributions regardless of the source, contributions received from the candidate or his or her immediate family, contributions that are not deposited or do not post to the candidate's account or that are returned to the contributor and contributions received in support for election to a different office or to the same office in a different election year for example if you ran for office in a prior election cycle and you had a surplus balance of funds that you carry forward to your current election campaign those funds cannot be used for the purpose of qualifying for public financing for the November 2020 election. Required information for qualifying contributions. In addition to maintaining and reporting the required contribution information, such as contributor name, contribution amount, and the date of the contribution, the contribution list must also include the address of the contributor's primary residence. This cannot be a business P.O. Box or other non-residential address. It must note the deposit date and deposit batch number of the contribution, and it must note the method of payment, such as check, cash, or credit card electronic contribution. Candidates must provide detailed supporting documents, records verifying all contributor and contribution information reported in the contribution list. Contributions with missing or insufficient supporting documents may not be approved. Please take special note, the information contained in your, contr your contribution list must be consistent with the information in your supporting documentation. Any discrepancies or inconsistencies between the two may result in the contribution not being approved for your application. Reviewing the qualifying request and contribution list. Submissions are reviewed on a first come first serve basis. They are reviewed in the order that they are received. The Ethics Commission has 30 days to review a qualifying, requ a qualifying request and provide determination if the candidate has met all requirements of the program. Any incomplete submissions or requests may be rejected. We also cannot accept any supporting documentation that is not filed electronically with your submission. However, there is one caveat to that any contributions that were received electronically through a credit card vendor the supporting documents for those credit card contributions should be provided directly to us by your credit card vendor or merchant that is the only um, alternative means that records can be submitted to us otherwise they must be submitted with your electronically filed application any documents records sent to us by email or in paper copy will not be taken into consideration with your application. If it is determined that you are eligible to participate in the public financing program, 
Candidates for the Board of Supervisors will receive an initial payment in the amount of $60,000. This payment will be issued by the city's controller office and will be initiated by our office. You do not need to do anything. Uh, it is an automatic process that will happen. In order to receive that payment though, you must have a supplier ID issued by the controller's office. If your committee has not received a supplier ID, please contact our office as soon as possible you will need to provide a signed W-9 to our office, which will be provided to the controller's office. This will establish a supplier ID, which is um, essentially an identification number the controller's office uses to issue any payments to uh, any entities, business committees uh, under the program. So if you have not received a supplier ID and you are interested in receiving or participating in the public financing program, please contact our office as soon as possible with a W-9 so that we can initiate that process for you. Please also remember participation in the program or any eligibility determination is not a guarantee or promise of the total amount of funds a candidate will receive. We will go in later on what is the maximum amount of funds that a candidate could be eligible to receive. Just remember, simply because you were determined eligible to receive public funds, and simply because you received an initial payment is not a guarantee that you are entitled to receive any additional amount of monies above that initial payment. What happens if you are not certified? Candidates may resolve outstanding issues and refile the qualifying request as long as that filing is received no later than the 70th day before the election. This deadline is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020. After this deadline, some resubmissions of existing qualifying requests may be accepted, but the executive director must issue all final determinations for eligibility no later than the 55th day before the election. This deadline is Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. In the event that any committee may be facing either of these deadlines, our office will communicate clearly what your options are to continue refiling and providing additional records or contributions in order to establish your eligibility. For more detailed uh, examples and information regarding the resubmission and refiling process, please review the supplemental guides for public financing. Candidates are allowed to appeal a final determination by the executive director to the Ethics Commission. Please be aware though, that the failure to timely file any required form statement or qualifying request is not eligible for appeal. So please be aware of these deadlines because if you do not meet these deadlines to file, you will not be allowed to uh, you will not be allowed to appeal those missed filings to the Ethics Commission. Once eligible, Candidates may submit claims for additional public funds using a matching request and contribution list. Matching requests must include the same information and supporting documents used for the qualifying request. Submissions are reviewed on a continuous first come, first served basis, and additional public funds will be matched at a ratio of six to one. What's not noted here is our office will be, respond, be responding to a matching request within four business days as required under the law. <clears throat> so once you submit that matching request, you will get an update and you will get a determination within four business days. For the, this election cycle, the November 2020 elections, the maximum allowable funds candidates can receive are $195,000 in matching funds on top of the initial payment for non-incumbent candidates, and 192,000 for incumbent candidates. And this table on this page also notes the amount of private contributions that candidates need to demonstrate they have raised in order to receive those amounts. The so non-incumbent candidates will need to have demonstrated they have raised $32,500 from contributors, and incumbent candidates need to raise $32,000 in order to receive that maximum. Please also be aware that under recent changes to city law, contributions are now capped at $150 per individual with means 
single individual will only be matched up to $150. If someone contributes a $500 contribution to you, we will only match the first $150. The remaining balance will not be eligible to be used for any matching funds. Part three, eligible candidates. Candidates for mayor and the Board of Supervisors will have additional filing requirements when their contributions, including public financing or their expenditures reach certain levels. All candidates are required to file an initial threshold statement whether or not they are participating in public financing. The statement must be filed within 24 hours of reaching a predetermined threshold for contributions raised and or expenditures made. For candidates for the Board of Supervisors, this initial threshold is $10,000. The, the supplemental statement is an additional filing that will be required within 24 hours once a candidate's contributions or expenditures reach $100,000 or increase $10,000 above that amount at any given time. However, the, the supplemental threshold statement is only required for candidates that have been either certified eligible for public financing or in or are in a race where at least one opponent has been certified eligible for public financing. <clears throat> Publicly financed candidates are subject to mandatory expenditure limits, which are called individual expenditure ceilings. The IEC limit applies to candidates once they are certified as eligible to receive public funds. This means that the combined total of a candidate's paid and accrued expenses may not at any time exceed the current IEC limit. Exceeding your IEC limit may result in fines and or a required repayment of all public funds received. An individual candidate's IEC level can be increased but cannot be reduced or removed. Please also note, an IEC is pegged to an individual candidate, which means multiple candidates in the same race could have different individual expenditure ceilings. A detailed explanation of IEC limits and adjustments, including examples, can be found in the Supplemental Guide for Public Financing and on the Regulations page under the Law section of the Commission's website. The use of public funds. Public funds may only be used to pay for qualified campaign expenditures and to repay loans that were used to pay for qualified campaign expenditures. What are qualified campaign expenditures? These are expenditures that were made for the purpose of furthering a candidate's election campaign, such as campaign literature and mailings, radio and TV ads, and consultants and other professional campaign services. Candidates may not use public funds to pay for expenditures that do not further their campaign, such as late filing penalties and administrative fines, non-campaign related legal fees, post-election activities, such as election parties or consultant staff bonuses. Using public funds on these types of expenditures may result in penalties. However, candidates can raise additional private, pu private funds to help pay for these types of expenses. Please also be aware that the burden will be on the candidate to demonstrate through a reasonable accounting method that they had sufficient private funds to cover any of these non-qualified campaign expenditures. After the election, as previously stated, candid candidates may continue to submit claims for matching funds up to the 30th day after the election. This deadline for the November 2020 elections will be December 3rd, 2020. Even after the election, candidates should only use public funds to pay for qualified campaign expenditures. Unexpended public funds. Any surplus funds remaining in your account on the 30th day after the election will be considered unexpended public funds and will need to be forfeited to the city at the conclusion of your audit. Please be aware, unexpended funds will include all funds.
funds in your account, regardless of the source, whether they were received through the public financing program or through private donations. The supplemental guide does go into more detail about unexpended public funds. You can also consult the law section of the commission's website. Candidates may continue to raise private funds after the date of the election. However, only funds raised more than 30 days after the election would not be subject to the forfeiture under the unexpended public funds clause. And again, as a reminder, all publicly financed candidates, regardless of the amount of public funds they receive, will be audited. This audit process will begin within 60 days after your first post-election campaign report is due. For the November 2020 election cycle, this first post-election campaign report will be the year-end report due on January 31st, 2021. This concludes the introduction to the city's public financing program. We will continue accepting uh, additional questions through the chat function, and please feel free to submit any questions to ethics.commission at sfgov.org, and we will try to provide answers um, at a later date if we are not able to address all questions that you have right now. Thank you again for your attention and participation in this program. Please feel free to contact us in the future with any questions you may have.